All right, yeah, you're muted. There's Kent. I made it. You made it. It's almost yeah. going to be a bad habit here at the end of the term. <laughs> this is the last Zoom for this rotary year. So. Yeah. George, are you going to be able to make it uh, to the meeting on the 26th? Yes, I was uh, uh, late getting back to Steve, but I let him know this morning. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and that's at Sweet Caroline. Yes. And it's our regular meeting time. It's just in a different location. It, it is. It is. A yeah, we're going to do it. It is a social. Okay. That'll be fun. Kent didn't want to do a formal speech, even though we'll prompt him. <laughs> Kent, you've done it, been a great leader. Hard to believe your year is up. I will admit it's been quick. <laughs> And yet, lots yet to be done. That's for sure. And I'll have to retrain a new one. I just get them trained and then they're gone. <laughs> well, Karen, well, you have other jobs now too. When do you, have you started your job with the uh, foundation? <clears throat> yes, I started mid-April. Yes, I have. We're getting things going. And Daryl Vagie's staying on to be donor relations. So he's quarter time. But yeah. Looking to get out and talk to people about that foundation too. So. Karen, oh, you'll do a great job. You're a perfect match. <laughs> Thanks, George. And per the usual on a Zoom, I'm going to wait about one more minute. Okay. Set my watch here. Hi, Susan. I turned my screen on for you. <laughs> I just scarf my lunch quick. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. Well, let's go ahead. Whoa. Call the uh, June 12th of 2023 Rotary Club of Ames meeting to order. And with that, per tradition, 
Uh, we'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please follow. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And as always, a, a moment of silence, memory or thoughts, and uh, received word uh, that Tim Grandin's mother has passed away. Um, Karen, I will assume as we know more about those arrangements, you'll let us know. So we'll take a few uh, moments to reflect on that. And uh, um, if there's anyone else, uh, please go ahead and uh, I don't know how you'd let me know. Um, send in word and we'll make note of that um, and share that information maybe at the end of the meeting. So let's take 10, 15 seconds here. All righty, thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any guests other than our special speaker for us today, but John, we'll let you go ahead and uh, lead us as you so wonderfully do. Okay, well then I guess this will be uh, targeted at our special speaker. Uh, we welcome our guests and visitors each week. Welcome to you from Inns Rotary, Nauveda, London, Augay, Paris, from far off lands of the USA. We're glad that you are here today. Come back again whenever you're near. Join us and then we'll make it clear. Around the world you will always be. Welcome at Rotary. Awesome. Thank you very much. Significantly appreciate that as always. And as always, a call out to uh, others that would be willing uh, to assist John and Louie with uh, leading us is always appreciated. This coming Tuesday, a week from tomorrow, I should. Oh, that is tomorrow. Whoa. Um, June has gotten away. Tomorrow at 630, Rotary Night at the Iowa Cubs. Uh, one thing of note, if you're able to go, it's greatly uh, appreciated that you can attend. And my understanding is $5 of each ticket sale will go to Rode, uh, to uh, Polio Plus campaign. And then the uh, Gates Foundation has continued to match that. So if you think about it, your $5 adds another $10 to the battle against polio. But it's also a great time for fellowship with fellow Rotarians throughout District 6000. So if you're able to attend, please put that on your calendars. We have two meetings remaining in June. As Karen noted, this is the last one, last Zoom meeting for us uh, under my term. And June 19th, we'll have Tricia Crane, ARC of Story County. And that'll be at the Plex and the filling station will be our theaterers. And then the last meeting of the year is we typically call Passing the Gavel. It's gonna be a social event and that will be from noon until one at Sweet Caroline's. So uh, please make sure you come, bring a guest and we'll uh, look forward to that opportunity to uh, um, honor the new incoming um, board and president and officers. And I don't, let's see, uh, I had two, two announcements regarding today. Today in history, Anne Frank was given her diary, which is amazing that they have it. And uh, we all know of the historical significance that that has created. Also today is National Peanut Butter Cookie Day. So if you haven't done so, uh, make your favorite peanut butter cookie or run out to your uh, local crumble and go get one. It's also appropriate World Day Against Child Labor, which just really feeds back in a little bit to our topic of last week with uh, uh, human trafficking as well. So uh, just some items to keep in mind as uh, we f reflect on what this day has to offer. I don't have any other announcements. If there are any, please uh, signify. 
and we'll uh, let you go ahead and you can unmute if there's any announcements further to share. Seeing none, Ms. Childroth, I'm gonna give you the podium. All right, well, thank you, Kent, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce to you my coworker, Susan Guiazda, and she's gonna talk to us um, and present to us information um, that all communication and event things related to the city of Ames. Susan is a very, very busy person um, with the job that she does for the city and for the community. So just a little background on Susan. Um, she has worked for the city of Ames for 18 years. Prior to that, she managed the public information office for the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and also worked as a reporter for various newspapers. Susan has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and master's degrees from ISU and Drake University. Additionally, she is an Ames High School graduate and attended Central Junior High School in the building that currently houses City Hall. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Susan. Hi, thank you all for having me here today. It's exciting to be here. Um, I did uh, speak not that long ago about the Climate Action Plan, but this is an opportunity for me to speak more about what it is I do, something very near and dear to my heart, something I'm very passionate about. And so I'm gonna take a minute and share my screen so I'm sure that you can see. Um, when Deb first asked me if I wanted to present in person or on Zoom, I said I didn't really care. But um, I realize I often use these um, talks about communication to do crowdsourcing. So it's a little bit more difficult in a Zoom environment to get some buy-in from all of you, but we'll figure it out, I think. Uh, communication has changed a lot over the years that I've been involved in it. And I do like to hear about where people get their information. And so, um, you know, at some point, maybe in the chat, you can um, put some comments in if I have questions and I will certainly look at that um, as we go along. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, see how it works. And there. Okay, can everybody see my screen? If I can get a couple of nods, yay, great. All right, and let's make sure I can advance my screen. There we go. So, um, what we'll cover today is just a basic introduction. We'll talk about the communication goals of the city of Ames, some of the tools that I use, and then we'll do a wrap up. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how do people get their information and how can we do a better job of reaching them? It's probably not a topic that a lot of other people think about, but I spend a lot of time thinking about how communication has changed. Um, when I got into this business, uh, it was, uh, I've been in communications for 30 years. Like all of you in all your different professions, nothing stays the same. It changes and we have to evolve and we have to use new tools and we have to find new ways to do things. And communication has changed gradually for my first decade or so in my career, but the last decade it has changed rapidly. It is really different how we communicate today versus 30 years ago. So um, why do we communicate at the city of Ames? Um, we have a goal at the public information office and that is to brand a positive city identity that we want Ames residents to believe that the city of Ames is the premier provider of municipal services in a vibrant, progressive, innovative university community. That is the goal of the office. That is the filter by which we look at the materials that we produce and that we want those materials to show people that we are caring, reliable, innovative, trustworthy, efficient, and responsive. Now, it's not necessarily that we use those words, but we're trying to um, show people how those words are part of a foundation for what we do at the City of Ames. And why is that important? It's important because transparent government is a foundational uh, building block of democracy. And I don't want this to sound like um, it's, it's, uh, it's bigger than it is, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. Having worked in journalism and having um, a sense from the side of the journalist that um, everybody plays a role 
journalists are watching government. <laughs> government is transparent and responsive to the people. We all play our role. The citizen, citizenry has um, a responsibility to be educated, that we all need to play our role for this to work effectively. So we want to be very open and transparent when we communicate with residents so we can respond to their needs, so we can build trust and that we can encourage engagement because nothing is worse than working in an organization that thinks it's doing the right thing and thinks it's doing what people want only to find out that we are way off base. And so um, that's why communication is important. So I don't wanna suggest that I do this on my own that um, communications at the city of Ames, and I use the words public relations, public information and communications. I use those words um, interchangeably. When I was in Dubuque, it was called the public information office. Officially in Ames, it's called the public relations office. I've heard it called the communications office. I have a lot of titles, <laughs> um, but I don't do it alone and I never have. Uh, we have several different uh, staff members assisting me. We have a group called the Media Production Services team. They prim primarily focus on video, but also digital and social media. In our purchasing division, we have somebody that works on graphics, and that person is playing a larger and larger role uh, in our communications. Uh, through our IT department, through our technology, we're working um, that, again, that digital component in the website. And then in my office, specifically in public relations, we're doing general communications, events, media relations, and website and together all of us are the public relations team. We work together to, to generate our messages and to get those out to the public. So when I talked about what the goal of the City of Ames Public Information Office is, I talked about it saying uh, that we're branding a positive city identity and branding is this word that um, I didn't hear much 10, 15 years ago, but it's become very popular. And so I'm just gonna talk really briefly about branding because um, I know you've heard the word, and for most people, it really doesn't mean much, but in the world of marketing and communications, branding has become very, very important. Um, what does branding do? How does the City of Ames brand? And what is the Visual Standards Guide? I went through 20 years of my career and had never heard of a Visual Standards Guide. And what a Visual Standards Guide is for every organization and for every company, it's kind of the rules on how you should present your, your uh, company, how you present your logo, how you um, describe your company. So we'll just go quickly through branding. Um, why is it important? Um, the way that I think about branding is, I think about it as being an organization or a company's reputation. It's the feeling you get when you hear the name of the company or you see something that reminds you of the company. And branding delivers a message, even a subconscious message before you even realize um, what the, before you read the message, you've already had a thought about this company. It connects people to products, it connects them to services, it connects them to companies. And the way that organizations brand and brand appropriately is that they do it consistently. Now, branding is not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just simply a way of associating yourself with your customer. And it should be a good thing if you're doing it correctly. So you need to be consistent and you need to know your audience and you need to follow your visual standards guide. The best way for me to describe branding is to say, look at these popular logos. And I deliberately took the names out, but I know that you know what those, what those brands are. And that is with each one of those, you know what it is and you have a feeling usually. So my kids are huge donut fans. And I'm guessing most of you have figured out which one of these is the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, logo and my kids could recognize that logo a mile away. They know it and they immediately have an association with it. It is a good product that they can afford. So they're going to head for that, uh, for that logo. The one uh, above it, and that's um, I'm sure one that many of you know as well, Disney, and it immediately brings into most people's mind a lot of um, connotation for most people. It's a standard of service. It's uh, magic. It's a vacation destination. Maybe it's movies. Um, and then uh, another logo we see in the upper right hand corner, uh, Target. I'm sure most of you have recognized that logo. Again, you might have a good or bad connotation with that. 
but you know what it means, you know the store. And we at the city of Ames would like people to have an immediate reaction to our own logo. And we want that reaction to be positive. So when we talk about branding a positive city identity, that's what we mean. And those again are the full logos that you see. And most people recognize dozens, if not hundreds of logos, and you see them every day. A lot of times you not even realize you're seeing it. We're exposed to a lot of external stimuli that kind of sinks into our brain. And um, that idea of reputation has really become an important part of communications. So one of the things that uh, I mentioned was a visual standards guide. We have um, a multi-page visual standards guide that talks about how we use our city logo, how we present ourselves, how it physically looks, what color everything should be. Uh, just a little history. The City of Ames logo that you see here is a shared logo. You might have seen it around the community with other organizations. The Chamber of Commerce uses is a very similar logo. However, theirs is blue. The Ames Community School District uses a similar logo, although theirs is orange. And the Ames Convention and Visitors Bureau in their um, official doing business as, not as Discover Ames, but as the Convention and Visitors Bureau has a red logo. And so color is really important. Um, we need to make sure that when we are sending out materials or developing brochures or pamphlets or whatever, that we are stick to that green color because we don't want there to be any confusion as to who is sending information out or who is speaking. And so um, what branding does is it sort of creates this foundation and allows you to build and produce your pieces in a way that people recognize them very quickly. And if you have that reputation, that's good. They might actually read your letter or pick up your postcard or look at your flyer because they know it's from the city of Ames and they have a good feeling about that. And so we work a lot on that. So um, over the years that I've been involved in communication, there's been a lot of basically tools in the toolbox that we can use. And some of them are now kind of traditional communication tools. And those are sort of the paper products that you see. Uh, the newsletter, if you are a city of Ames resident, and I'm sort of assuming that most of you attending today are living within the city of Ames um, corporate uh, boundaries and that you get our monthly newsletter, which is called Cityside. It comes with your utilities. And um, that's, uh, that's considered a traditional piece of media. It comes out every month and we've been doing it for decades. I, it was ongoing when I got here 18 years ago and I have continued to produce it. We also do something, uh, we, we, do private, we do press releases. I have some examples of those on the screen, what those look like. Those are generated and they go to what is now being referred to as legacy media. Legacy media are your newspapers, radio stations, and television stations. Those three core fund foundational media sources are called legacy media because we've expanded and we have so many different ways now to disseminate information that we've distinguished kind of the old way from the new way. Traditional, media, uh, traditional communication is also our events. We do dedications, ribbon cuttings, and celebrations. I just want to put in a plug uh, this Saturday on June 17th. We are part of the Juneteenth celebration at Van Schell Park, which will go from noon to 4.30. But before that, we will have a renaming dedication ceremony at the Ames Municipal Airport that is open to all, 10 a.m., and we will be renaming the Ames Municipal Airport to James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport and James Herman Banning's uh, great nephew, Christopher Hart will be in attendance. He has a really impressive resume um, and he will be there to give some um, additional background on his great uncle's legacy in aviation. So we do a lot of events, uh, events and recognitions. We want people to be proud of this community and we want them to know of things that are happening so they can be proud of that. We also have regular meetings and we try to get the information out as well. Um, some more examples of some of the things that we've been doing. Um, we had just in the last few months, we've had the mayor's bike ride. We had city council night at the band shell. We've had a water pollution control facility open house for the community conversations on mental health. At our council meetings, we are often giving out proclamations and we've done hydrant flushing. So these kinds of activities are just the sort of the ongoing way of doing business. And we are constantly pushing that out information out. 
So digital communication tools are something that have really taken, um, have joined the forefront in the last decade. And that's when our media production services, it used to be called Channel 12. And for anybody that was a MediaCom subscriber, you might remember that Channel 12 was the government access station. And it's still there on MediaCom. You can still access Channel 12 on MediaCom, but now we call it Ames TV. And we've used the media we use that media production skill set to do more with social media. Social media is huge. Um, at this point, I'd usually say, how many of you are on social media? But I'm just guessing that a lot of you are. <laughs> um, it's become a really common way to get information. And there are um, a lots of different social media platforms that you might be accessing. But I'm just going to take a guess and say that more than half of you are probably accessing information on social media. Also, website. Websites have always been pretty uh, a pretty good source of information, but in the last decade, they have really become a prominent source of getting information. And so website takes up a lot of our time. We need to make sure that information on our web is the most accurate, up-to-date, and timely. And then we've also um, delved into digital newsletters. So let's go into a little bit more about this media production. I'm going to see if this runs a little video. Susan, if we're supposed to be hearing something, we can't. It's just background music. Oh, okay. It's pretty jazzy background music. <laughs> you could hum a few bars. <laughs> okay. So I, apparently there was no music with that, but it really was just background music to kind of jazz you up. Um, but what, uh, what it did show is that video shows, video shows, it's not telling people, it's not having them, to, they don't have to read something. Uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. We have learned that video uh, is a really quick way to disseminate information. Uh, you could see those events, those different things that were happening. It's um, one thing to describe a fire, a fire. It's another thing to see the video. And I think that we're seeing that um, through the um, increase in prominence of uh, platforms like YouTube and TikTok, people like that. They like to be able to see things. We also have learned uh, over the years that the old format, the kind of documentary, long form network television, is just not what people want anymore. They want everything short to the point, they want eye-catching graphics, uh, quick videos. And of course, we have to consolidate our, our news and information because people seem to have less time to spend on it. And there's more competition for the time that they do have. So we're learning as we produce these videos, shorter, more visual, snappier, and uh, grabbing people's attention. Social media is the same way. Um, and we have really jumped into social media, I would say, with um, much enthusiasm. We have been on Facebook uh, for more than 10 years. That sort of surprises me when I see that uh, information out there. It's, Facebook will tell you how long you've been on it. Uh, it cracks me up now when I think to the fact, to the idea when we were discussing, should we do it or not? What is this Facebook? Should we get involved in it? It could be just a fad. Do we really want to do it? And we said, what do we have to lose? Let's do it. And so we jumped into Facebook and it wasn't just the city of Ames. Um, if you think way back in time, um, the city of Ames started doing Facebook, but our departments also kind of started doing Facebook pages. Uh, we had clubs and boards and commissions associated with the city of Ames. They started proliferating like mushrooms. We had so many Facebook pages out there. We just, we couldn't, we didn't know what it meant to have a Facebook page. And um, like mushrooms, not so much mushrooms, but anything that you plant, it needs care. And so we determined over time that it was just too many. We consolidated those. But even to this day, we have more than 20 Facebook pages associated with the city of Ames. 
I'm down to tracking probably eight to 10 of those on a regular basis. We have Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're on LinkedIn and Nextdoor. Those last two have been in the last five years that we have gotten onto those. Um, we are involved in these platforms at different levels. I will tell you that on Facebook, we are publishing, posting out information two to five times a day. And that takes a lot. We also have a, a kind of an informal policy where if people put questions or um, comments on Facebook that are um, actual legitimate inquiries that we respond within 24 to 48 hours. So sometimes the questions are pretty elaborate and we need to get information. But we use these as just like um, social media is very similar to an email, to a phone call, to somebody making an inquiry. If somebody asks us a question, we respond. So it's a great communication tool and it works its best when it's two-way communication. We're experimenting more on LinkedIn and Nextdoor as ways to get information. Each one of these, um, when we talked about legacy media, those were um, broad-based mass media. Social media can be very much more niche media where we only see certain populations or people with certain interests that um, use these. And so they're different. We really had to kind of play around with how we can be the most effective with them. So here are some of the things I mentioned that we work with our graphic designer, some uh, a um, person who works in our print shop. Graphics are really important. Graphics tell a message, graphics uh, direct attention quickly. And so um, the square, because Instagram is a platform that requires a, a square as it, it's the most optimal format. We do a lot of graphics in a square, which is also different for graphic designers. Uh, so most of our graphics are square and they pre present really nicely on the Instagram and the Facebook platforms. And so we are constantly working on these. Now let's look a little bit at our website. So the City of Ames website, which I hope you've all uh, discovered and found, www.cityofames.org. We're in the midst of looking at kind of uh, maybe a um, remodeling of our website. Not quite yet, but we're getting closer. But we know the website's a very important tool for people. And so we spend a lot of time uh, working on it and updating it. According to our resident satisfaction survey in 2022, the uh, website was the number one source of information. It allows 24-7 uh, government. So people who want to pay a bill in the middle of the night can do so. They want to fill out, um, apply for a permit. Um, they want to um, sign up for a parks and recreation class. The website really allows us to extend our opportunity to serve our citizens. And it meets citizen expectations. People expect to be able to do those things now. And so um, we need it to be there and we continue to look for ways to upgrade our web. It's kind of fun. Our uh, website does have a translation tool where you can translate it into a, over a hundred languages. It's in the upper right. And sometimes I just translate it into different languages for fun, just to see what it looks like. And um, uh, it's a helpful tool if you are an international student and you've come to Ames and you need to translate it, um, it's helpful. So what are, some, what are things people do on our web? Well, they pay their utility bills, they pay parking tickets, they apply for uh, rebates and permits. They can report issues with, with um, city infrastructure like a pothole. Uh, they can get information on the city code. Uh, they can apply for a job and they can get general information about our organization. So we include a lot of, um, we have a lot of pages on our website. So one of the, I think, hidden gems about our website, and I hope this is not new to you, but if you go to our city website and you look on the front page, there is a brown box and that brown box says e-notification. And if you've never clicked that button, I would really encourage you to do that. Cityofames.org, click on the brown button, and it will pull up this form uh, that is on the left of your screen. And it allows you to click for information that is of interest to you. And when you get down to that new section, I would really encourage you to hit city press releases. That gives you access to those media releases that I send out. Sometimes every day we send out those media releases, but it goes right directly to your email box. You are getting exactly what the journalists in central Iowa receive and you get it within an hour of when they receive it. So um, in today's communication world, we still work um, 
very closely with journalists, but in a lot of times, we, a, a lot of situations, we don't have journalists that are uh, following us or interested in our news. So we have to be both the source and the disseminator of the information. So you will find if you click that city press releases button that um, only a tiny fraction of the news releases that we send out actually make it into the legacy media. And we are doing a lot more than you may even be aware of. So again, I encourage you to take this opportunity and fill that out, tell your friends, um, if because you'll be the one in the know from now on. And so they'll wanna know how you know all this. Tell them to go ahead and go to that e-notification box. So just a quick example of how we typically take um, an item and run it through our communication tools. This is kind of a case study. So one of the ones that we happens every year is the idea that if you park your vehicle on a snow ordinance and it snows more than two inches or it's forecast to snow more than two inches, we need to let people know that the AIM snow ordinance is in effect. And so what we do is we send a press release out. Again, if you were on the e-notification, you would get that press release. Um, we send the press release out to say, hey, the snow ordinance will be in effect. It's, this is the time it's going to be in effect. We send that to newspapers, radio, and television. And in this situation, most of our legacy media does put that information out. They usually run it at a banner uh, on the television at the bottom. They um, put it on the radio. They put it on their websites. We put it on our city website. There is a red bar that can go at the top of our website that uh, has any kind of emergency information. So we put the red, we activate the red bar and we actually have a scroll across there that says snow ordinance in effect. We get it out on AIMS TV and then we put it out on social media. And that would be some of the tools we would use for um, publicizing this event. So social media has begun to play a big role in a lot of these uh, events that have a time element involved. So we might not know that the snow ordinance, we may get, if we're lucky, two days notice, perhaps a day's notice. So we need to use all of our uh, really timely communication tools and social media is excellent with this. So we put out a bunch of posts and in general, before a snow ordinance goes into effect, we probably post it five times. We definitely have had people say, I get it, I know, <laughs> but, I would rather over post than under post. And so we sit, let people know, hey, this is coming. And then during the event, we give people updates. These would be the kind of posts that we would put on social media. Here's some pictures of what's happening outside your window. Here's uh, what you need to know. We're out here, we're working, we're plowing. This is how much snow we got. And so that's how social media has kind of impacted how we handle um, allowing people to uh, look, alerting people about snow ordinance. So I did mention one other tool that we have and that's digital newsletters. We have kind of tried to um, delve into this world a little bit more. If you're an Ames Parks and Recreation customer, if you have an account with us, you probably have seen this come into your uh, mailbox, the Ames Park and Recreation digital news brief. It comes out every week. It's pretty exciting. We've been doing it for about a year now. It has um, a circulation of about 10,000, which honestly, is uh, probably more than any of the, the traditional media that we have in Ames that can potentially reach a lot of people. We know 10,000 people are not opening those emails, but they get it. And then the last one I have is our internal newsletter to city employees called C Slickers. That used to be a printed uh, publication. And we have moved that to a digital publication for employees to learn about what's happening within the city. And that transition was not without a few bumps. Some people were not happy with the digital newsletter, but I think it's it's actually been pretty smooth lately. And people, um, uh, we are able to give them their newsletter plus links, video, and it's and basically value added. So I think it's it's getting its fan base. Um, going back to the Parks and Rec newsletter, one of the fun things about digital newsletters is that you can target them. So when you sign up for a Parks and Recreation account, we have things like your ages, your um, geographic location, and we can target a message specifically to you. If you're somebody that has um, signed up for um, swim lessons, you <clears throat> might be interested in the princess party, or you might be interested in the conquer the current event that's coming up where we're gonna walk in the, in the river channel there. So we can target information directly to people who might be the most interested in those. 
And then finally, this is when I usually ask for participation. How do you get your information? And I'm not going to do that, but we do survey people as part of our resident satisfaction survey that we have sent out every year since I've been here and well before me, we're in our 40th year of the resident satisfaction survey. We ask people, how do you get your information? And these two uh, top two tier getters have been the top two for the past five years. Social media and the city of Ames web have continued to lead the way in how people are getting their information more than our Ames Tribune newspaper, the Register, um, the Daily, more than um, uh, local radio stations. And uh, the Sun actually wasn't even in the, the 2023 survey has been uh, released. Uh, it's uh, been sent out to people. We have just gotten all those surveys back and we're gonna analyze that information, but we're losing media. So we don't even have some of these on the current one. But we do tend to look at this as a way of kind of getting a sense of where people are gaining their information and where we need to be. But I always leave that door open. I'm always looking for more communication tools. And I do believe that as we go into the future with technology and advancements, and people being more mobile, that the other communication tools will emerge and we will be exploring those as well. So with that, I'll leave it with, uh, with back to you. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And if you have anything you wanna comments, go ahead, you can leave them in the chat if you want to, or email me at a later date. So Susan, we do have some questions in the chat. If you want to pull those up and just yep. kind of run through those one by one, you can go ahead and read the question and, and then respond. Yeah, okay. So how do you decide the colors for the shared logo? Um, how did the other colors, how did the colors get assigned? So the shared logo was about 10 years ago and um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, because of their association with Iowa State, immediately said that it was important for them to have red because they actually have what is officially Iowa State red. It's Pantone 186. So that was an easy one. Um, I will say that the chamber had a preference for the blue because blue has a cup as a cup, a color has been associated with banking, I guess, or commercial. They had, um, they weren't claiming the blue, but they had said they had a preference for the blue. And honestly, the city of Ames did not have a color preference. It's one of those things that's very um, subjective. And we um, really were just looking at the palette. And so those colors were decided. We ended up, um, of the colors that were presented to us, there was a purple, uh, there was a blue, there was a green. Um, I, I, somehow we got the green and the, uh, uh, the other colors were assigned. The school district came later to the game and asked if they could have the orange, which was great because nobody else had it. So um, there are other colors and um, it's possible that other people might join the, um, the logo. But at this point we're starting to see now this logo is more than 10 years old. Um, I kind of think that what we'll see in the next decade is probably a movement or maybe a way to other logos. I really like this idea of this joint the collaborative approach to the logo, but, uh, and a lot of cities were doing it, but I don't know that we'll be able to maintain it. Let's see, has the e-notification notice been in the city newsletter? Um, yeah, ever so often we do put it in city side. We're more apt to put it on our social media and say, hey, you know, do you want to try to get, you know, do you want the latest updates? We have a common uh, social media post, but if you're not on social media, you probably haven't seen that. So we certainly could make more of an effort to put that e-notification in the newsletter. That's a great suggestion. I love it. Is there messaging coordination with the university and with university communications on some of these things, like weather emergencies? Yes, actually, our snow ordinance goes to ISU News Service. They post it immediately to their website, and they immediately share any of our posts on social media. There have been several events in my years here at the city of Ames, where we have worked basically um, hand in hand with, with the university. COVID comes to mind right away. Census comes to mind right away. Um, there are some of these universal big issues that we have worked together with. We do cross promote and we do actually get together quarterly uh, as a communications 
uh, as communications entities, um, some of the larger communicators get together four times a year to talk about cross-promotion opportunities, what's coming up. Rag Rai is another one where we're, we are all promoting with the Convention and Visitors Bureau or Discover Ames. So, yep, we do try to do those. Great suggestions. I really appreciate these, these comments. Very thoughtful. And I think that's all of them. I always ask people, are there places we should be? You know, where are we not? Where would you think, I get my information here and you guys don't ever put anything out there. So that's really what I, I'm always worried about or missed opportunities. Where should we be? Oh, I don't have me to come. How else can I watch Ames TV? You can actually get a, a it's streamed live off our website. Uh, right, uh, not too far away from that brown button that said e-notification, there's one that says channel 12. And you can go right to that and you can uh, watch the video stream on our website. You can watch city council meetings. You can see our regular programming. And you can also go to a video archive. If you miss a, a, a meeting, you can go and actually find that meeting and watch it at your leisure. So, great questions. I really do appreciate the feedback. It's really helpful to know where we're not quite connecting with the very people that we're trying to reach. So it's very helpful to me to get this. Any other uh, questions or observations for Susan? I have a question, but I can't type that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so on the... Um, Resident satisfaction survey, how do you determine who is approached for that? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had people say it's fake or we don't really do it. Um, that is, the resident satisfaction survey, I think, is in its 41st year. It has been done in conjunction with Iowa State University, so we don't actually do it. And they have um, developed um, a baseline number of responses that we need. We start out by printing a paper copy of the survey and it is sent out to 1300 randomly selected utility bill customers. So they come up with a random a randomizer and um, we end up with 1300 um, US mail surveys that go out. I've had people who say they've lived here 40 years and never received them. And I've had people who say they've received them twice, which is pretty amazing. Um, I actually got it one year and didn't fill it out, but I would have filled it out. It would have been great. Um, but uh, we also now in the last five years have given people who get the paper copy the opportunity to go online and fill it out. And then in addition to that 1300, it goes by email to Iowa State University students, junior or senior year or above. Um, and in order to, in the end, get a sample population that hits the criteria for the ISU statisticals, uh, to, it fits their formula, it's the best they can say. So that's where we get it. It goes randomly to ISU students who are junior or senior uh, level, and that simply goes by email. And for the residents, it goes by paper copy, and it's from the utility bill list. It's great information. I mean, it really is helpful. Um, we have benchmarking questions. So those questions are the same every year and they ask about satisfaction levels with city services. Like, how do you feel that the parks look? Um, are you happy with traffic synchronization? Um, you know, what is what are some issues that the city should address? There's open-ended questions and then there's um, a lot of check the box. And so it's a real, it's, it's a commitment, it's 12 pages and people will fill it out. And they, um, they spend a lot of time with it. They're very um, conscientious and, um, it's, um, and it's read because we present it to the city council. If you're curious about the results of those, if you go to cityofames.org and look under city manager, uh, I think the last 10 years are up there. You can read the reports. They're not, <laughs> they're not light reading. They're about hundred pages long, so, but they're good. What's the response rate on that, Susan, on that? Uh... It has varied. Um, two years ago, we had about 30%. Last year, it dropped to 20%. So that's very strange. We're going to look at that this year to see. Um, I am worried uh, a paper survey that's 12 pages long, 
could um, adding the digital uh, option, adding allowing people to fill it out online, I think will be is helpful. And we're seeing more um, people fill it out online, but it is not a self-select. You can't call me and ask me to fill it out um, because it is an actual random sample survey. Is that 30 or 20% uh, for the city as well as for the students? Or? I think that was I think that was the average of the two. Yeah, yeah I'd be curious, curious to know how, how much heavier the email response might be to the written. That might answer some of that. So even if we have, um, we've had to cut the student, we will not let the student response be higher than 50% of the total response when we look at the analysis. So we do limit it that way. And in a sense, it's a bit stratified in that it's a random sample. You can't opt yourself in, but we do look at the demographics of the community to make sure they're reflective. We did not do that one year and student surveys were too much. You could just tell the survey results were not normal. And so we've looked at that to make sure that the population that we are gathering information from reflects the community demographics. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad somebody said they received one and they put it in the mail a day late. Oh, that's okay. I'm still getting them today. They were due, uh, I think, sometime in May and I'm still getting surveys. I still collect them. <laughs> Don't tell people that, but I still collect them because I want people's voices to be heard. How was the AIMS, the A swoop design determined for the uh, logo? The current, the, the A, the current logo? Yeah. Um, we, you know, these things, <laughs> uh, we had a designer. They had, there were, there were other design opportunities. They all looked at the letter A and that was the one that resonated with the most people. We did put them out again. This was 10 years ago. We put them on the web and said, vote for the one that you liked. Um, this was the one that was the most popular. The city of Ames part of our website, uh, or sorry, of our logo didn't change. It was just the, it was just the initial, the A, that was the difference. So um, it was just a design that people liked. They thought it was modern and forward thinking. And that's what we went with. Anything else that uh, anybody would like to share with Susan? Fascinating as always, Susan. Really appreciate your time and commitment to uh, to your service and to presenting to us. And Deb, I noticed you in a couple of those pictures. Well done. <laughs> you know, if you work here, you're apt to fall to get pulled into some kind of campaign. <laughs> and you know, over the years, I believe several Rotary members have been in our campaigns as well. I'm thinking particularly in our census campaign. So. I appreciate the willingness of your group to get involved. Well, as we conclude, as typical, I have two quotes I want to share. One from uh, Bill Gates. I think we may have heard of him, founder of Microsoft. Bill shares, if I only had $2 left, I would spend $1 on public relations. He's only got $45 billion left, so we'll see what he does with that. And then the other one, which I'm trying to pull, apologize for this. A lot of problems in the world would be solved if we talked to each other instead of about each other. And I think that's what's really neat about what, Susan, you are doing. You're asking, you're inviting, and you're sharing. Very, very uh, uh, willing to accept what is there and communicating it back to us. So thank you for that service. We appreciate it significantly. Well, I don't have anything else to add as we conclude uh, this last Zoom meeting for my term. So let us go to the four ways test. Of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Meeting adjourned. Thank you all for your participation.